Track it is time for your Nooner with Dooner right here on the live stream and your Fiverr with the drivers on Sirius XM. Thanks everyone for joining us. It was an amazing sports weekend. Unless you're an Iowa fan, Caitlin couldn't finish the story, but Cody Rhodes could. It's an amazing, amazing weekend of WrestleMania action. My uh, Over in Philadelphia, my boys are seven and nine years old. They did such a great build on this one. The Rock and uh, Triple H, who's in charge now, Cody Roman, all those. My, my seven, nine-year-old turned to Cody Crybabies at the end of Saturday night when Rock was standing victorious. But by the end of the side, Sunday night, we let them stay up late. They had an amazing time. But one thing I'd like to call out is here in transportation is the production team and the uh, the road crew that puts together WrestleMania. Check out this post from Michael Schirkenbach right here. Take a look. He says, Philadelphia, shout out to Mike K, Kenny, Leo, Malden, and all the other drivers who helped us load in this massive show the past two days. They get in around Tuesday and they have to build out this huge, huge, massive set for the multi-day weekend event that the WWE is going to do. And, you know, this business, like we always talk about, it's all about relationships, especially in this space where everything has to work. Every piece of pyro has to go off when it has to go off. Every camera has to go when it's cued. And they've been having this since 2007. Check out his other posts. He's says our first wrestlemania rig hard to believe wrestlemania 4 we got another post from here yeah that one right there wrestlemania 40 is kicking off this evening mike hager and his talented team are standing by for this multi-day loadout after the event that's the show motion team i mean probably one of the most underrated things about all this if you watch one of these live events is how quick their video team throws together a package like the main event ends then they have the entire night recap that comes out amazing stuff but hey it's uh, Eclipse Day, and now we got a little more stuff going on. Is the spot market in the path of totality? Well, my buddy Ben Tashirgi, he made this amazing meme right here. He said, freight brokers are pulling out their solar eclipse glasses for market updates. Thank you so much. Um, by the way, imagine going blind from wearing counterfeit eclipse glasses. I just saw one of those alerts on the news before I left the house this morning. Although, is that like a PSYOP? I, after I heard that, I was Googling to see if there's any data on like people who have gotten injured from counterfeit eclipse glasses. There was like one guy in California, and I don't know if that was counterfeit glasses or not. Either way, oh, Big Al says he got an email from eBay two weeks ago telling him that the ones that he bought were used and he was getting a $10 refund from the seller. Well, that meme is all about what Craig Fuller posted. Craig Fuller posted, the market is soft right now. Tender rejections are roughly in line with 2023 numbers, which represented all-time lows. If you look at the uh, chart right there, you're going to need your Eclipse glasses. But Daniel DiMartino Boots, she said, as I said on stage with Freight Alley at Freight Waves in Chattanooga, um, there are known macroeconomic leading indicators such as backlogs and chemicals, but everything must be transported to meet demand or lack thereof. That makes freight the leading market indicator. Like I said, you're going to need those Eclipse glasses. I see in the green room, Leffler put his on. The spot market rate, $1.53 right now. That's uh, without fuel included. That's down 8.38% from last week. Someone online was like, yeah, so what? You know, pre-pandemic 2019, just keep that chart up. I want to horrify people. Keep that chart up. One fifty three. Um, Someone online was like, ah, oh, this is like 2019. You know, who cares? That's what the market does. Yeah, but here's the thing. Retail diesel fuel costs are up 33% versus 2019. Also, it's not the norm. Look at that chart. What looks normal on this chart? So we got to get the information out there to the people. The other thing you need to know, it is Eclipse Day. There are bans. There's going to be a lot of traffic. I told you on Friday, look out for any fuel or issues like that, like fuel outages, things like that. But also in Texas, over 80 counties, a 480 mile stretch of the state have banned um, oversized loads in, in excess of 8.6 inches. And Kerry Jablonski says 32 million people live within the path of totality, and there could be over 100 million people that come in and join that. Noah Reinshek says everybody's got their, well, y'all, we're looking at the eclipse. I was still grinding post ready. Think I'll go with only totality I know is total commitment to the grind, but might adjust. Noah Good stuff. Good writing prompt. Now, one more piece of bad news before we get to some guests over here. There have been more carrier shutdowns. Clarissa Haas covered both of these. Carrier shutdowns, California Trucking Company. You got that image for me, Izzy? 
All right, Clarissa Haas reports a California trucking company has shuttered operations after 19 years of hauling general freight throughout the state. At the time of its closure on Friday, French Wargy Trucking of Fontana had 32 trucks and the same number of drivers, according to the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration Safer website. Yeah, there you go. Uh, this is the second Fontana-based carrier to cease operations this week after the formerly family-owned Tony's Express, which is a 70-year-old less-than-truckload carrier, closed its doors a year after selling the company to John Ole in March 2023. John Ole, he's the CEO now of Tony's Express. He sent in a text message Thursday, which was obtained by Freight Waves. It says right here, this went to his employees and his companies. The current market just didn't support our ability to operate and be a profitable company. And the cost of fuel in California made it difficult. We were in a very serious discussion with two different companies about coming in and partnering or taking over Tony's and those fell apart at the very end. And literally, it was a last minute decision. Ole said he had plans to have, he has plans to have Tony's Express employees paid, but he did not provide a timeline for when that's going to happen. So hopefully that gets all resolved. But let's get into the rundown. Today's episode 700 of What the Truck taking place on this historic eclipse day. Woo pig, we should be talking to the University of Arkansas about its supply chain program. Um, hopefully we hear from students and professors getting a master's and all that. We've got armchair attorney Matthew Leffler. He's breaking down all the latest with Project 44, Four Kites, the defamation case. He's going to update us a little bit on AB5, uh, how it's going to impact truckers. Maybe we'll talk about the eclipse. We'll talk about Oh, some dangers with ELD certifications. We got a lot to get into with him. And we have John Oldman Jr. He talks about Rock River Valley Traffic Company's upcoming 36th annual or 38th annual truck driver competition. Who's taking home the trophy this year? I don't know, but I do know that Matthew Leffler is already here. So let's go to him while we're waiting for the University of Arkansas. Matthew, how are you, buddy? It's so good to be here. Dooner Eclipse Day has arrived. I cannot be more excited. Now, I noticed you have the glasses on. Are you in the path of totality? We will have 93% of the sun obstructed by the moon. I we have an yeah, image of the path of totality, too, so all of you audience listeners as well can have an idea. Matthew, show that image. Matthew, let me ask you again. Are you going to be in the path of totality? We will see it in St. Charles. Not the full thing, but about 93% will be obscured. My kids are being pulled out of school early so they can enjoy this. We got four sets of glasses. Oh, Dooner, I'm excited. I love the moon. I love the sun. I love science. You love science. You love science. Hey, by the way, have you ever represented anyone? I'm trying to get to the bottom of this because we see all these warnings about counterfeit um, eclipse glass. Have you ever, ever represented someone who's been injured, has had an eclipse blindness injury? No, I haven't. But less than a minute of exposure staring at the sun can last with permanent damage to your eyes. So you got to be careful. You got to use stuff that's been uh, certified able to do this. Uh, shade level 14 welding glasses can actually help you. Uh, but I would definitely check online to find the resources that can help you see the stuff without hurting your eyes. <sighs> Well, Matthew, you've been like a, a dog chasing its tail. You've been all over that Project 44 versus Four Kites case. You broke it down brilliantly online. You broke it down on the show a few weeks ago. But since then, I've had their founder and CEO, Jet McCandless, on after they had their court decision. He made these comments right here. Let's play the tape, and then we'll have you break it down. Roll, Jet. Yeah, I, I try not to comment on open legal cases too much, yeah. but uh, – it is an interesting situation, I would say. Uh, it's good to see the justice system uh, working. I think it's, I find it very, very bizarre. I mean, you essentially have private equity and venture capital firms essentially supporting corporate espionage, not only supporting it, but also funding it um, and keeping the existing management and, and in place. So I know if I was a pension fund or an LP and funds like this, I would, I would be asking questions, but uh, it's, I find it, I find it really peculiar. And, um, uh, you know, what I'll say is that when they go low, we go high and we're just going to keep operating our business. The irony of this whole situation is, uh, four kites is probably about twice our size when they, when they uh, made these, these false comments. And now, you know, we're more than double their size. So, uh, you know, I think just for folks out there, and I think I have a lot of support because this industry just has so much, so many people that are high integrity, and, uh, you know, these types of shortcut games just don't get you to on a long term uh, game plan. It's a small industry. No, not at all. And I appreciate your comments. I realize it's an ongoing case. There's only so much you can Please. say. Uh, before we go to yeah. Matt, obviously, Jack can only say so much. It's an active case and everything. But what he did say were some interesting things there. What did you get from that? 
don't need eclipse glasses to see a bad idea happening. And this is what happened with four kites. The reality of all of this was uh, P44 was half the size of four kites when this litigation began, and they're double the size of them today. The important thing for everyone to understand watching this right now is this is just the beginning. In the litigation, we were at the thing called the pleading phase, where you say, I think this thing happened, I want to go to court. And four kites tried to stop it. It went all the way to the Illinois Supreme Court, and the Illinois Supreme Court said, yes, we think there's a case here. Now it goes back to the lower court, and in this case, four kites will have to respond. They'll have to answer. They'll have to assert their affirmative defenses. This is just the beginning. Maybe it's the end of the beginning, but we are in the beginning. Huh. Yeah. Well, I mean, where do we, where do we, so you said this is the beginning. Where's the end? How long do we, where, what is the end? These are legal things, so it can take forever, but is there any end point you see here? How much is left to unwrangle? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the reality here is that 97% of all cases settle. What happens next, if this thing continues through litigation, after they have an answer from four kites, you have this thing called discovery. And discovery is when you ask questions. They call them interrogatories. You request documents, request for production. And this discovery thing then leads into depositions, sworn testimony. This could go on for a year. It could go on for five years. Heck, it could go on for a decade, depending on how litigious these parties are. But the reality the reality is that we now have a claim that four kites must respond to. We have nothing proven yet. There's allegations, but we will then get to the next phase, which is the discovery phase. And very few companies enjoy discovery under any circumstances. All right. Well, Matt, thank you for keeping us up on that. Now, there is a an alert that came out um, in March. This is from March 22nd, and I really wanted to bring it to your attention because you made a great comment online. It was truck to truck worm could infect and disrupt entire U.S. commercial fleet. And what this was talking about was a worm that could be transferred over Wi-Fi via ELDs. And when I cover that story on here, I even talked there. There was an instance where they followed a truck in a Model Y and via Wi-Fi, they're able to transmit this worm to the truck. Then the ELD goes to to a truck stop, and then it infects everybody within range. But this made you, this was eye-opening to you in a lot of ways as well because of some issues that are going on the legal front. Talk to me about this. So the electronic logging mandate happened a few years ago, and a lot of companies embraced this technology. The challenge about ELD, specifically in the United States, is many of these manufacturers do this thing called self-certification. They go to the FMCSA and say, hey, we did it. It works. People should buy it now. And there isn't a real look by the government regulators as to the safety of the technology, the efficacy of the technology, and all of the other pieces. We understand un without any uh, question of controversy, the future is case, connected, autonomous, shared, and electric. The connectivity, whether it's P44, four kites, or a thousand different ELD providers, everything is connecting to everything. And if we are allowing industry to self-certify, that opens us up for risk, it opens us up for liability. Ultimately, I think we're gonna move similar to what Canada did and have the regulators actually look at the devices first, make sure they're up to date with the most reasonable things possible, because in the world of technology. It's offshore everything, lowest cost provider, and get to market. And if that is your goal as a VC, that's wonderful. But as a, a supply chain that must have resilience, it is not the way to go. So for me, as I look at self-certification for ELDs, I question it. And I think this idea of a worm that can travel from truck to truck or truck to trailer or any other place, uh, we have to be observant of this. And so often, Dooner, our ability, uh, our technology outpaces our ability to regulate it. That can't happen here. We have to be proactive. We have to take the right steps early on to make sure that we prevent the risk that is absolutely on the horizon. Matthew, why is self-certification a thing in the first place? It seems that anytime you allow something like that, it, it opens the door for improprietary behavior and people taking shortcuts and maybe not doing the right thing, which in turn can lead to an industry-wide problem when there is a worm that goes around like so. It's about lobbying, right? I mean, the end of the day, people want to get their products to market and they want to have as few regulations as possible. You look at things like the supplement industry, they don't have FDA regulation. They very clearly say, we're not regulated by the FDA. Uh, if people want to have something that is proven safe in an application, you have to have regulation. And I get it. It's expensive. It takes time. It means you can't get to market as quick as you want to. But if we're thinking long term and 
God willing, we're all thinking about things long term. We should be making the proactive steps now and say, I understand it's going to hurt shareholders in the in the short term. It might take some people out of the market entirely, and it might create more barriers to enter. But is that a bad thing? I don't think so. All right, Leffler, let's move on to something. Let's move on to a little uh, employment law that's going around. This one has threatened our industry ever since the whole rideshare thing came up. By the way, they bought their way out of it. Uh, but even as freelancers concerned, even as people like me concerned, who also does freelance work outside of this, my wife does freelance work. What's the state in AB5 right now and what impact is it having on the industry? AB5 isn't going anywhere. To your point, the gig company spent over $200 million to exempt themselves from regulation. And they were successful. They got a ballot on the California and they got it passed. If the trucking associations want to be exempt, they're not going to win in court. They have failed in every single attempt. As I correctly predicted, AB5 is just a test. It says, we assume you're an employee, even if you think you're a contractor, and it's up to you to prove us wrong. The ABC test test is common in many, many states. The reality is if you want to be considered independent, and this is California specific, but it kind of makes sense everywhere, have multiple customers, have a corporate oversight, have a corporate structure, LLC, sub S corp, whatever you want to do. Um, this is again, not legal advice. Don't take legal advice from a television show or a podcast, get a lawyer. But the reality is AB5 is not going anywhere. And every trucking association, every interest group that has said it's going to stop, they're going to knock it out. They're wrong. They're pedal something that's not accurate. Now it is time to understand compliance. And if you misclassify somebody, misclassification will cause your business untold damages. It is not insurable. You don't have an insurance policy to protect you. And when you get hit with this stuff, you have to pay the attorney's fees of the other side. It is a nightmare. So I very much tell people, uh, get into compliance, make sure you're doing the right thing. Very interesting. Well, very smart, too. Make sure you're doing the right thing. Now, what is doing the right thing? What is the biggest legal mistake transportation companies are making right now? It is the same problem, Dooner, that they've been doing for many, many years. It is misclassifying workers. It is saying somebody is an independent contractor when they're not. It's saying somebody is exempt from overtime when they are not. And if you misclassify, this has been a problem since Decades and decades and decades. It's not a new problem. We have very few new problems. But the reality is, if you're misclassifying people, we saw this last year with TQL. We're seeing it unfold right now for Fifth Wheel Freight. Uh, if you classify somebody as exempt and they're actually hourly and they're owed overtime, the liability is astronomical. I mean, it is something that you have to deal with right away. And if we look back at the deposition of Ken Oaks from TQL, he said he got his advice on that classification from TIA. I know TIA is getting ready to kick off relatively soon. How many other brokers are in this uh, potential risk pool? Who knows? But if you are trying to avoid the biggest pitfalls in the industry, get with your attorneys, make sure you're doing everything correctly, that the right contracts. Look, you PM your truck, you give it maintenance every quarter, every six months, whatever. Uh, you need to do that with your contracts too. And if you're not doing it, you might find yourself on the other end of hostile adversarial litigation and nobody has the time and the money for that. Matt, very, very good words. Now, the last question for you, that was companies. How about transportation workers? What is the biggest mistake, legal mistake that transportation workers are making right now? You can go with brokers, you could go with truck drivers, you can go with anybody, it's up to you. I'm going to continue to tilt at this windmill until the end of time, Dooner. It's signing non-competition agreements. It's signing non-solicitation agreements. It is taking things that used to be your rights and giving them up for nothing. We have been at-will employees for many decades in this industry and all industries, to be fair. But the reality is the FTC is probably not going to come and save you. Congress is probably not going to come and save you. The only person that can protect you from doing the wrong thing is yourself. And that is making sure that you understand what you sign. Not all non-competes are bad. Not all non-solicits are bad. Not all non-disparagements are bad. But you better understand them before you put pen to paper. Because if you do and you don't understand it, oh, buddy, it will not be a pleasant tomorrow. Matthew, hey, great stuff. Where to, what's coming up next out of you and where do people find you? I understand you got something with Britain Lad coming up. I love M&A, Dooner, and the coolest deal we saw this year was the merger of Omni Logistics and Forward Air. It's a lot of controversy. It's a lot of moving parts. This Friday, I think it's noon Central Standard Time, 1 Eastern, Britain and I sit down and we break down 
what is without a doubt the most interesting merger in transportation in decades. We talk about the stuff in Tennessee, we talk about the stuff in Delaware, and we talk about the one hour before they were actually going to go to trial, and they made the deal happen, as I predicted. Excellent stuff. Well, Matthew, take care. Enjoy that eclipse. I hope those aren't counterfeit and you do not go blind. Take care. <laughs> you and me both, buddy. Thank you, sir. Take it easy. All right, everybody. Meanwhile, let's see what we got here. Oh, look at this box. All right. So it's a big, big windy day. This is, uh, I believe this is Wyoming, right? I believe this is going to be, yeah, we're looking at Highway 85 out of Cheyenne. That's what Hack has to say here. So anyways, for your audio listeners, a bunch of winds blowing this trailer up and everyone in the comments is yelling, you know, so I hate running light, especially through that area when you got to go through there. Mike Fitzgerald says now all the driver needs to do is fully recognize and accept that except the threat and park it. Dan, the driver wrote, said, I had that happen to me on I-39 in 1989. When the trailer came back down, it came down hard. Shipping Mike Meat says, I hope that underwear was extracted okay. Ugly truckers, mail trucks running 16,000 pounds, scary AF. We ran late all the time. I hated that S. And Nick Thomas says, wow, y'all should make a championship belt and give it to that driver. I might have ordered a belt right last night on WWE.com. We'll find out about that. But right now, let's find out about the program over at the University of Arkansas because they are on the line with us right now. Hey, who do I have with me? Hello, University of Arkansas. Well, hey, Dooner. It's David Dobrikowski. How are you, buddy? <laughs> hey, David. What's that? Someone put in the comments, Nathan. I'm like, I don't know a Nathan. I, well, I hope David shows up on the line because I do know that gentleman. No, no, no. You, you'd rather have Nathan. He, he's a lot more knowledgeable and a lot better looking, but, but you're stuck with me and, and some of my, my friends and colleagues here today. So why don't we just quickly go around the horn? We've got a great group of faculty, our, our department chair, of course, and then um, you know four of our learners who are currently in the master's program and also uh, an alum from the program. So why don't we go ahead and introduce ourselves? Go so my name is uh, Lauren Schneider. I'm in the second year of the program, so I'll be graduating next month. Very excited for that. Um, I'm currently working at J.B. Hunt. I've been there just over two years now, and I work in our intermodal division, division as a management trainee, spending time in our corporate operations and corporate pricing departments. Hey, um, I'm Melanie Lowry. I am in the first year of the program here. Um, also work at Uber Freight, been there for seven-ish years, um, and just excited to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us. And my name is Kate Billheimer. I'm a second-year student as well with Lauren, wrapping up in the home stretch of the program. And for the last 10 years, I've been in telecom, primarily doing transportation and inventory consulting. Yeah, and good afternoon, good morning, Austin Connolly. I'm actually a graduate of the program about two years ago, um, so I'm an alum on the panel. Uh, work at Kinview, formerly Johnson Johnson, working on the supply chain replenishment side. Hey, Duna, Mark Scott here. I'm a faculty in the program. Within the program, do a lot of the work on the distribution side of things, and real pleasure to be here today. Hey, Duner, it's Brian Sugar, department chair. You know, woo pig suey. Thanks for having us. Yeah, woo uh, pig to all of you. <laughs> That's it's awesome. Well, thanks for having us, Duna. We're excited to be here. Well, hey, I'm sorry. By the way, you guys, where your beautiful campus is located, I think you're right in that path of totality. Do you have big eclipse plans after this? We're pretty close. We're pretty close. We're right on the kind of like on the outer limit of it. Yeah. So we're we're waiting for things to start to get dark. You know. We've already got our glasses on. We're excited. <laughs> well, wait. Well, it, it's been uh, it's been at least six months since last time I checked in with the program. Tell me a little bit about the program and now. What's going on and what you all are studying? Really exciting stuff happening. You know, we have this uh, thirty credit hour master's program. We now actually offer three different formats for it. We have our executive blended format, where learners come to campus once per month, and then on the off weeks, there's content delivered online. So that's awesome for folks who are looking for a bit of face-to-face -face engagement. Uh, we have a fully online version of the program now, so for individuals who, you know, want to complete their master's degree but may not live in the area, may not be able to travel in, and or may just have, you know, jobs that require a ton of flexibility, the online option is a, is a terrific option, same curriculum as the executive blended. And then our third option, which is actually the newest, is about a year old now, I think. It's a three-plus-one program that allows undergrads to earn up to uh, six credit hours or two classes towards their master's degree, finish their undergraduate degree, go away, get a great job, and then you know finish up the master's program 
uh, in an accelerated fashion online. So a lot of uh, exciting innovation around the delivery uh, of the program. Where? You you know, you mentioned something there. I can't let that just pass by. Where do students go after this program? Where are you placing people? Yeah, well, you know, uh, the learners that we have with us today are, are great representatives of that. I mean, our our learners finish up and they're most of our learners are working, first off, to start with. About 99% of them are already working in supply chain. So a lot of them advance within their current organizations or, you know, change jobs, right? Because everybody's looking for you know, good opportunity, good fulfilling opportunity. But our, our learners work for the finest supply chain organizations in the world. Of course, Walmart, the Fortune One company, you know, located right here. We have JB Hunt, Art Best, Uber Freight, Tyson Foods, many, many that I'm forgetting. Um, 300 of the Fortune 500 companies, you know, are here. And about 2,000 CPG firms have offices of, of a substantial presence, say, you know, 50 or 100 employees or more right here in Northwest Arkansas. So it really is a hub for supply chain. And most of our folks uh, are, you know, working in Northwest Arkansas for those organizations. But we also have students, you know, coast to coast, man, California to, to the East Coast, um, as far north and south as you can imagine too, Florida. Um, so they're really, they're really, you know, everywhere. That that hog brand, man, is coach to coach. <laughs> it uh, it, su- it it woos it woos far and wide. Let's hear from uh, let's hear from some of the students. Um, anyone want to tell me where you were working and why you decided to jump into the program? What are you learning? How has it been helpful? So I started my career at Jamie Hunt uh, a few months prior to joining the program. I actually got promoted several months ago within JV Hunt. And I believe having the knowledge that I learned in this program to be able to speak to, you know, supply chain issues on a really high level was able to, you know, differentiate me and get me into the role I'm in now, especially coming from having an undergraduate background that uh, wasn't supply chain. Very interesting. Anybody else got a story? Yeah, sure. Share away. Same here. So I, um, my undergrad is in languages and arts and completely opposite of supply chain. Um, kind of fell into the industry by accident at what was then TransPlace. And uh, I got hooked on the problem solving. I love the fact that we can manipulate the business so quickly and so easily and that if one thing doesn't work, we just try another. So um, hooked me enough that I came back to earn my master's. And then while I've been here, I can say honestly, Every single class that we have had, every single face-to-face session, I walked out, and that week at work, something has come up related to exactly what we talked about in class. That that's isn't that the beauty of supply chain. Once you start doing this stuff, it's like you get the spell book to like the inner workings of the economy, and you start to understand what's happening. You start to see things in the world around you that you wouldn't look at otherwise, even just trucks on the road or trucks touching a dock. And that's where that artful language background that she has comes in handy because there is a little bit of that, you know, transportation. <laughs> hey, you know, you mentioned something here. So most of the people that are in your program, they're not necessarily like undergrads in high school that are looking to get a supply chain education. They're actually already working in the field. What are the opportunities for people who are already working within companies? Have you, do you have any good examples of people who've been able to get financial assistance from their own company? Yeah, so for sure. So I definitely think probably the main benefit to the program, especially in the blended format, is not only just the access to our amazing professors and faculty that we have here at the University of Arkansas, but also the, all the industry executives that we have in our backyard that we've been able to learn from, and just the ability to learn from our um, peers that are also in the program. I think with everyone's diverse background within supply chain, there's just so much to learn. It makes you such a more well-rounded um, supply chain professional moving forward. Has anything you've learned like blown your mind? You were like, whoa, I had no clue. That's even how that worked. So uh, I'll have I got a good story. I had the pleasure of having Dr. Dobrikowski as a professor. And at the end of each lecture, he would say, are you thinking differently than when you walked in? Mm-hmm. And um, I honestly could say yes, because I was at a restaurant where you go up to the line and you say, hey, I want the chicken, I want the rice, whatever, whatever, whatever. And I uh, had a great story of the reorder point. Um, someone behind me wasn't able to get chicken because I took the last batch. And then that's when the employee was like, oh, we should go make some more, right? And so that affected at a disruption in the supply chain. Consumers weren't able to fulfill their order, right? And so for me, the first thing I thought of was reorder point um, when I really should have been thinking about, you know, eating dinner. So it really changed my perspective of how I view uh, of supply chain in the real world. 
You ruined him forever, David. <laughs> you do. You can't even order chicken normally anymore. This, this, this is why nobody leaves this business once you get into it. Nobody looks for it, but then once you're in, you're like, you're stuck because you're thinking like you in line about the chicken, and nobody else can relate to you except for other uh, supply chain people. <laughs> That's how this yeah. works. Well, how what is life like on um? So you do you guys go to like the campus over there? What is life like on campus? Um. Well, to be honest with you, we're here on Saturday, so it's great. Oh. Awesome. <laughs> Um, we kind of miss out on the uh, day-to-day during the week when all of the main student body is here. But um, I actually graduated from here for my undergrad, so I, I can speak to both. And I uh, like the executive program a lot better. I love the free parking. <laughs> and we do we do uh, very mindfully schedule our class meetings around football season, right? So everybody's still able to go watch the Hawks. We're good. Oh, yeah. And then the catered lunch is also nice. That's always a good plus. <laughs> oh, wow. So is it like in the morning before the game, you got the class or is it after the game? <laughs> sort of. <laughs> it depends. Yeah. It, it depends. Well, what what is what's most popular? Like, uh, David, what are you teaching right now? Like, what is most popular with the students? What modules are people really sinking their teeth into? Yeah, we we've had a lot of innovation around the curriculum. Uh, you know, we're now delivering, of course, all the fundamentals of end to end supply chain are covered. But some newer kind of innovations that might be of interest to you is we now offer a supply chain finance course because obviously speaking the language of finance is very important for supply chain people, especially based on what's happened, you know, over the last couple of years. Um, we also have a, an ESG and supply chain sustainability course that's that's uh, new, uh, as well as a risk and disruption uh, course, which, you know, obviously couldn't be more relevant. So it's really great because we're, we're able to be on the cutting edge of, of curriculum development um, and bringing in real experts to uh, to teach in the program. You know, Kate had mentioned executives, you know, and being in the classroom with executives. But some of those executives, you know, also come and transition and then they teach for us. A good example is Joe Metzger, the retired VP of supply chain from Walmart, SVP, uh, or excuse me, EVP. Pardon, pardon me, pardon me. Don't want to, I got to get those letters right. <laughs> I know they're important. So retired EVP from Walmart, he's teaching for us now in the program. And in the online program, you know, we have the benefit of being able to reach beyond our geographic boundaries and have people like Daniel Stanton, Mr. Supply Chain. I co-teach um, our class with him. Uh, or Sherry Heinish from IBM, the supply chain queen, you know, is able to teach a sustainability course, ESG course. So, you know, we're able to tap into not just, you know, experts in the field, but, but put them in a position where they can teach really innovative topics that they have deep expertise in. Hey, speaking of deep, deep expertise, I've got Professor Mark Scott with me. Tell us a little bit about some of the innovation in your course, Mark. Uh, well, we're doing a number of things to, to, to speak to what you ask, do that. I think one of the things we see a, a, a quite a bit of interest within the course that I teach, which is the deliver courses, how much uh, understanding and quantifying the customer uh, uh, really lends itself to understanding how we segment supply chain. So we've gotten a lot of feedback on that. We really go into and study uh, psychographics, filmographics, and all of the nuances of the customer, how the customer profile is changing, how customer behavior actually impacts how we fulfill orders. And there's a lot of interest in that because, of course, of the growing uh, omni-channel uh, uh, operations that are, that, that are uh, uh, front and sensitive. That's one thing. I think another thing that we speak to that is pretty interesting is the concept and understanding all of the uh, uh, a dynamic behind micro fulfillment and what that means and how we fulfill across different channels and how that is eva- uh, evolving. And I think subsuming all of that uh, in the course that uh, I get to teach, and I think some of the awesome learners here could validate whether or not this is truly so, uh, but <laughs> we could safely say that everything we do is indexed to a real live problem where we use data and it is hands-on and we literally solve real problems through every iteration of the module of the course and I think that stands out and that's what I've 
to date gotten good feedback on. From, I don't know if from your lips to, to from your lips to God's ears uh, on, on that data and putting real world application to it. I love to hear. It. Now, guys, this would this would not be a complete segment if uh, David, you did not lead us in a picture. So, could you please start us off, sir? Oh, an audio only call on the Hawks. Is that we got to do it, here? man? We got to do it. All right. Well, I can't see you, dude, but I'm going to count on you to get those hands up. Okay. Okay. All right, here we go. Hold your degree up, too, by the way. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. One, two, three. Ooh. Hey, Stewie. Stewie. Big Suey. Big Suey. Whoa, I love it, guys. Love it. Now, people want to learn more about the program. Where do I send them to? Yeah, we've got a terrific website that provides a ton of information. I think Nathan Bramwell, our marketing manager, provided a QR code or a link there uh, for folks. Uh, you can access the application. And timing couldn't be better, Dooner, because we're accepting applications right now. Uh, for another month or so. So now's a great time to check out the website and apply. And if folks have any questions, all of our faculty are very accessible. We'd love to talk to you. One thing about being a professor is that there's no place to hide if you have an internet browser. No place to hide. It's easy to find, even if you've got a last name that's 12 letters long and has a Z and a Y in it. Thank, well, hey, guys, thank you so much. Enjoy the eclipse today, everybody. Stay great, and uh, thanks for helping move America and learn all about our supply chain. We appreciate it. Go Pig. Thanks, Jenner. We'll pick. Take it easy. All right, elsewhere. This guy's got a, this guy's got a semi hauling some cars piece. right here, but a lot of people yeah, online, they are pointing this one out. Well, the girls oh are squealing, and they gosh. love it. They said, if you look there, it's only holding oh. one, two, three, four, five Teslas. They say, hey, usually I would be hauling eight or nine cars if I was using a regular truck. So maybe it's not all it's cracked up to be. But, you know, is John Oldham Jr., Vice President of the Rock River Valley Traffic Club. Johnny. How are you, sir? What up, Dooner? What's happening, man? You got a you got a really cool event. You DM me and you're like, Dooner, we like to look at cool trucks. You like cool trucks. Tell me about this event, sir. Yeah, we've got the uh, Rock River Valley uh, professional truck driving competition coming up. Uh, so there's a there's a whole driving competition uh, that's there. So we do pre-check and there's a whole obstacle course. Then along with that, there's a uh, an antique show and a um, a truck parade as well that that comes through uh, at lunchtime. So it's a it's a great event out here in uh, northern Illinois, uh, Rockford area. So we'd like to uh, extend an invite to to everybody uh, that that wants to come down. Drivers are are welcome as well. Uh, as long as you have a state certified CDL license, uh, you can participate. We get drivers from numerous states over there over there at the event. So. Uh, come on down to the uh, professional truck driving competition. 38th year we're we're holding that. Hey, John, do you know, by the way, do you know that you're on uh, Sirius XM right now? Do you know you're on the radio? Say hello to the radio audience. Hello, radio. Hello, radio audience. Now, get, get us, get us a, when our whistle, man, what happened? There's been 38 of these things, or there's going to be 38 of these things. What happened at the other 37? We got some pictures from some previous events. Tell me what goes down. What's exciting about all this? Uh, I mean, you know, if you love trucks, you know, we're out there supporting the, the trucking community. So there's, you know, getting to interact with the drivers. Uh, there's a lot of cool trucks that show up. So there's the one I snapped from last year at the, the event. Like um, yeah, the, the antique trucks are pretty cool. And there was a, some pretty, pretty big old style truck there that we've seen last year as well. There was no beer in it. I tried to drink it, but nothing came out. So. Great event, though. If you love trucks and, you know, love supporting the trucking community, it's just a simple way to get out there and and uh, be a part of it. And uh, it's a great time. You've got some fun. You got there's some very uh, nice looking trucks going on over in this pageant over here. Have you tried any of the skills competitions on your own? Have you entered yourself into this, John? I've actually judged it. So uh, I'm I'm not much of a truck driver, but I've gotten to participate in the the judging uh, on the obstacle uh, course there. So uh, Ken Schaefer, who's a uh, a past UPS Grand Champion and a uh, a Rockford Grand Champion, he designed this year's course and he's the uh, the court course marshal for this year's event. 
So it's pretty neat seeing the the obstacles that are put out there and you know just how precise the drivers have to be to to land some of those obstacles. Now, John, you are the perfect person for me to talk to because in a few months, I have to judge a trucking competition. I've never done that before. What kind of advice do you have for me? What do you, what do you look for when you're judging, when you're judging these trucks? Uh, fo- follow, listen carefully to the instructions. Uh, follow the, the rules and be consistent on your ruling. So, uh, you know, whatever those, uh, those, that criteria is, stick to that and uh judge everybody fairly who uh who gets involved with this what, what are some of the partners you involve in how many people do you expect to show up yeah there's uh there's a lot of uh a lot of people in the, the the freight world so a lot of different freight companies are involved the uh, maggio truck center supports that so maggio is a big uh trucking towing tow truck outfit in the the rockford area here and uh, they get behind it, uh, the Rock River Valley Traffic Club. So a lot of different organizations, again, just supporting the, the, the trucking community. What's the uh, most beautiful truck you've seen at, at one of those? Was it that, was it that Pegasus wrap? Yeah, that was, that was the, the, the nicest one. Last year, the event was, the weather was beautiful. The, the previous year, it was a little wet out there, so we didn't get to enjoy it as much. But uh, last year, the weather was perfect, and could get out and and see all the beautiful trucks out there on display and and the truck parade was pretty cool as well what's the goal of the event what do you want people to take away from this um well one we want we want the truckers to have a a, the truck drivers to have a, a place to to go and and practice their their skills showcase their skills uh for the community again we like them just come out and you know, see the see all the the hard work that the truckers put in, and just you know how skilled they are at these these obstacles. It it definitely gives you a greater appreciation for that. John, aside from this particular competition, this is just one event, but you are with the uh, what is this? The Rock River what? The Rock River Valley Traffic Club. What else goes on at the Rock River Valley Traffic Club other than just these competitions? That's kind of a mouthful. Yeah, by so the way. That- you have to say it over and over again. Yeah, we just say RRVTC. That keeps it a little simpler. But uh, yeah, the Rock River Valley uh, Traffic Club, we're uh, tr- uh, really a transportation group that's been together for over 85 years in the, the Rockford area. Um, we hold uh, different uh, luncheons. We have a, we have a turkey uh, giveaway that we do. We support local pantries and and you know, a little bit of community outreach in there as well uh, to to support, you know, the communities we're in. You know, and, and the reason someone would join one of these is like, I was just talking to University of Arkansas. Why do you go into a master's program like this? Yeah, you want to learn a little bit, but you also want to network, right? You want to work with those top tier shippers that they work with. This is a small business. I tell people that all the time, especially when they're out there saying really negative stuff. I'm like, be careful what pool you pee in. This is not a big industry and that's a good and a bad thing but mostly a good thing if you're not a jerk because it's very very easy to network so it's very smart to join these groups because you can see good professional results you can see good sales results they bring people together in this industry where people get lonely doing this stuff and we relate to one another so we need to meet one another to talk would you agree with that yeah i agree 100 percent. you know some sometimes people want to shy away from these uh these clubs you know they're you know, a salesperson may be worried, oh, well, you know, there's there's a potential customer of mine somebody else may call on. But at the end of the day, as you said, you know, it, it's a small world. We're all working together. You know, there, there's enough to go around everywhere. Again, myself, I'm a shipper. You know, I get to get the honor of serving the club as a vice president. That's pretty unique. A, a lot of the uh, other members in there are work for different freight companies but that doesn't it doesn't matter we're all in this together we're we're all there to network and work together support the trucking community support our customers and uh you know we we also hold a uh, an, an annual golfing event you know again just get out get together network and and support the you know anything to do with trucking and transportation
Very cool. Everyone, check it out. It's Saturday, May 11th, the Rockford 30th Annual Professional Truck Driving Competition. Connect with Rock River Valley Traffic Club or John to get that on. John, thank you so much for your time today. Don't stare directly at the sun at the eclipse today. Be smart. Make sure you don't have counterfeit glasses. Make sure you check the ISO on those, buddy. John, thank you for your time. Matthew Leffler, University of Arkansas. Woo, pig. Thank you, everybody. If you like this show, you can find it on Sirius XM's Road Dog Truck Channel 146, 5 p.m. Plus, all the replays you can find on podcast players everywhere. On demand, just look up What the Truck, Freight Waves, a YouTube channel, an entire playlist. Also, look up What the Truck. Find me on Twitter at Timothy Dooner. That's D O N E R. Enjoy the eclipse. Take care, and don't be a stranger.